Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be with you today and welcome you all to INTA's Roundtable on Trademark and Technology Strategy in Corporate Branding. My name is Isabel Cortez, Vice Chair of the Harmonization of Trademark Law and Practice Committee at INTA, and I will be moderating this roundtable for everyone. This roundtable is being hosted by the International Trademark Association, INTA, and organized by Pons IP in collaboration with the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office and the Association for the Protection and Defense of the Company's Trademark Rights in Spain and DEMA. The purpose of today's roundtable is threefold. One hand, to discuss the importance of an effective coordination between the legal trademark strategy and the overall business marketing or branding strategy. Uh, secondly, to discuss the role of technology-based legal solutions such as global surveillance and proof of use in the process of building strong brands. And we will also discuss on the new challenges and opportunities faced by innovation and the outbreak of new areas of technological disruption such as machine learning, AI, Internet of Things, 5Gs in the trademark perspective. So as you can see, we have different irons in the fire. So now let me introduce to you uh, our host, INTA, and to share with you a brief presentation about its highlights. So INTA, we are a global association of brand owners and professionals dedicated to supporting trademarks and complementary intellectual property IPs to foster consumer trust, economic growth and innovation, and commit and committed to building a better society through brands. INTA members benefits from the association global trademark resources, policy development, education and training, and an international network. So it's uh, around 6,500 organizations, 185 countries taking part of it, and 34,369 members. So as you can imagine, we have a global presence it was founded in the 1878 INTA is a non-profit organization with headquarters in New York City, but with offices in Beijing, Brussels, Santiago, Singapore, and Washington, D.C. And of course, a representative office in New Delhi. So anyway, if you would like to have more information, you are more than welcome to visit the website, which is under the slide, so you can have a look, and I encourage you to check it. Of course, INTA has a strategic plan for 2022 to 2025. Three main pillars. On the one hand, to promote and reinforce the value of brands. Second, to build a better society through brands. And third, to support the development of IP professionals. So to implement this strategic plan, there are more than 3,800 talent and dedicated volunteers to serve in INTA nearly 200 committees, subcommittees, and project teams. And the association committee uh, has three main major groups, advocacy, communication, and resources. Um, our annual meeting is around the corner, so the main uh, world largest, uh, largest event for brand owners, trademark, um, trademark professionals, and IP professionals as I mentioned, is around the corner. It would take place in Washington, D.C. in springtime, so the end of April 24th, May. And nowadays, we have more than 4,500 professionals that has already been registered. So I also invite you all, for the ones who have not done it yet, to go ahead and come to Washington with all of us. <coughs> We have today um, an invited speaker, a guest speaker. This is Maria Jose. I will introduce to you later from the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office. And these are the three main topics we are going to tackle during our, um, our roundtable. So on the one hand is marketing and legal strategy alignment, technology-based solutions for strong brand, global surveillance and proof of use, and innovation in trademark branding. So on today's, uh, on today's menu, 
I have the pleasure to introduce our invite guest speaker. We are lucky to have today a well-versed expert on the topic. So from the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office, I would like to introduce the head of the Distinctive Science Examination Area, Maria Jose Rodriguez. We are really happy to count on you for this event. Thank you, Maria Jose. We were supposed to have Andema with us as well. However, unfortunately, Gerard could not join could not finally join us. But uh, going back to Maria Jose, she has an extensive, I would say, impressive curriculum, I guess, an impressive career within the IP. Uh, Maria Jose has an extensive experience in intellectual property and trademarks. She was the head of the International and European Union team for many years at the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office. And now she is the head of the Distinctive Science Examination Area since 2021. So welcome, Maria Jose, for this round table. We appreciate to count on you, with, with, you know, today with us. And without further delay, I leave you with the Spanish Trademark Office. Maria Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Isabel, for this uh, presentation, and mm -hmm. thank you for having me in this uh, roundtable that I'm sure is going to great in a date, uh, in, in a really great debate, considering all these hot topics we're going to to deal with. Um, so I would like to to start with um, a statement uh, that I read in a McKinsey report that uh, it's it's about top trends uh, topics in in tech. And it says that in the next decade, we will experience uh, more progress than in the past 100 years. So um, this statement really called my attention. And um, just to put it a bit in context, uh, we have to consider that the steam engine meant uh, the first industrial uh, revolution. Then we have the combustion engine that uh, was the kind of second industrial revolution. And then in mid late 90s, uh, the internet uh, was the third industrial revolution. Um, we can say that nowadays we're facing uh, the fourth uh, industrial revolution, but this one is 10 times accelerated by the technological advancements we're facing. So um, it is difficult to establish um, a list with all these technological uh, advancements that we, are, uh, we have on the plate because uh, they're growing uh, fastly, but uh, surely there are at at least like 11 uh, sectors that are leading this race. For instance, uh, we have big data, blockchains, artificial intelligence, the internet of the things, 3D printing, 5E, robotics, drones, gen editing, solar photovoltaics, nanotech. And um, at this point, uh, we can consider that private sector is leading all this race, as I said, but um, they are not working uh, in isolation in this innovation system that uh, we, we, we have. Uh, also, universities, uh, research and development entities, and governments play uh, an essential role because they establish the incentives for all this uh, innovation system to be uh, developed. So we can say that uh, uh, public policies and regulation are the channels uh, to enable this uh, technological uh, revolution we're, we're facing. So it is important to align all these uh, public regulations and uh, policies to uh, better uh, improve all this uh, economic growth and, and all the related uh, things around them. So. Um, it's not only, uh, we have to consider not only uh, the, the tech revolution, but also to improve the traditional production uh, systems. So um, at the end, we can conclude that uh, we're facing this kind of, of uh, benefits uh, from the innovation uh, system and all this technological revolution, but we are foreseeing as well some challenges, and we have to be ready for, for all those. And um, uh, the main thing is that uh, in the field of uh, the trademarks, 
uh, we have to consider what are those potential uh, effects in, in, in this strategy. Uh, we've been reading some um, articles. Those are the headlines I've been reading recently on the media or in the, in the newspapers. And the first one, it says that Lexus presents an announcement of the new ES created with emotional artificial intelligence. In this case, uh, they created an advertisement in which with the artificial intelligence, they read your face. So it's, it's a software for, for the, fa the facial recognition. And um, they offer different advertisements considering your, your mood. So it's, uh, really, it's really interesting how this, uh, this technology is, is now in the, in the market. We've been reading that also uh, fashion uh, retail sector is, uh, is uh, cooperating with the uh, banking sector. So we, we're facing now some cooperation that previously we didn't really see in the market. Then we're reading some things uh, considering the, the metaverse impact, like uh, the architect uh, designing a, 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 an entire city in the metaverse that is called Liverland. So it's going to, to have like uh, a new universe. Then a um, uh, football team uh, is, is uh, starting the construction of this football stadium in the metaverse. So probably, um, that we're going to watch the matches uh, through, through uh, a screen, but in a different uh, sense, because we're going to be uh, there too. So it's going to be uh, curious. And then we have um, another retail sector uh, that is going through the metaverse. Uh, so the president of Mercadona just created Utopion, which is a, a new um, city in, in the metaverse. So we have to see how this is going to, to develop. So considering all these new uh, things we, we're taking in, into the market, um, we have to consider also not only the new things, but also the impact on the existing rights. For instance, we've be, we been reading recently this infringement of the rights in the metaverse of this uh, Hermes bag. Then uh, we see some defensive uh, actions. Uh, for instance, Disney that is creating this theme park, but in the metaverse. So it's like you can go to Disney and have all the same feelings, but in the virtual way, we guess. And uh, then we have uh, McDonald's offering the burgers in the metaverse. And uh, we don't know if you're going to be able to eat a burger in, the, in this environment, new environment, or how it's going to be. But uh, the thing is that they had uh, created this, re this new restaurant in the new uh, sphere. And then we have some brands that are filing uh, trademark applications for uh, the metaverse. So we we're going to see how the uh, goods and services classification are, um, is flexible in all those uh, situations. So consider all this new uh, scenario we can consider um, that the consumer expectations are changing, are facing different uh, things in the market. So for brands, it is important to, to redefine their, their strategy and to adapt to the new available uh, technology means. And uh, in this part, we, we have to, to consider two, two, two parts, let's say. Uh, not only the appropriate pro protection of the brands, but also uh, the new ways of, of infringement that can arise in this, in this new environment. So uh, it's important to know the appropriate defensive uh, means at this stage. Thank you. So thank you very much, Maria Jose, for your insightful and valuable presentation. I have to say that I'm really interested on the topic. This is a completely new topic, which is, let's say, hot today and nowadays. And uh, to tell you the tr truth, I'm not sure about how it's going to be developed in the upcoming, let's say, months, years. I don't know, because everything is so new. But I think that you raised two big important points. On the one hand, not only protection, but on the other one as well, infringement, how is this going to be tackled, let's say. So 
Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for the presentation and all the details you have provided to us. So now let's turn into the debate and uh, it's time to get, let's say, more comfortable and let's and move to the sofa here. So uh, anyway, please feel free and remember to ask any questions you would like to ask in the chat box. So, I mean, wherever you have a question, just, you know, write down in it. So we have like several questions to, to address to you, Maria Jose, today, this morning, which is a rainy day in Madrid. So sun today doesn't seem to appear today. So let's go ahead. According to the results on the report top 30 most valuable Spanish brands prepared by the marketing consultancy firm Cantar, Spanish brands have increased in value by 11% during 2021. So taking into account uh, this substantial increase, what are the reasons behind these promising results? And uh, how aware are the Spanish company of the importance of protecting their intangible assets? So thank you for the question. Um, I would say that it's a remarkable fact that in 2021, the value of the Spanish brand increased by 11%, considering all the uncertainty after the lockdown and the pandemic uh, situation. Um, during the, the, the pandemic situation, I, I guess all the brands had to force in the new society and the new trends, the new expectations, the new concerns that uh, the society had after all that pandemic. Um, I would say they had to change not only uh, the strategy, not only in the short term to overcome the pandemic, but also in long term, considering that the consumer is more um, concerned about uh, sustainability, well-being, and the kind of work-life uh, balance that previously were not that important. So um, at that point, it is important to, to emphasize that uh, they face as well this technological uh, disruption. So um, to align their strategy to all those things that were happening really, really fast was, I, I guess, a really big challenge for them. So um, the reasoning behind all the increase in, in the brands, it can be different depending on the sector because it's not the same like a fashion or bank, it really depends. But I would say there is a common factor in this growing because normally the adaptability, dynamism and uh, the innovation in the brand strategy are key factors in a globally connected and uh, really uh, fast changing uh, environment. So um, I believe that um, the innovation uh, in the brand strategy has to be understood not only in terms of um, like offering something unique in your sector, but also like uh, providing uh, or transforming what already exists, but also like uh, creating something new. We're seeing now some, some trends in, in some brands like uh, their so-called 360 companies in which you can uh, get everything you need. Uh, Amazon is, is a good example of that. So we can see all those, those changes. And um, I would say that the Spanish brands are really uh, aware of the importance of protecting the, their trademarks. Um, at the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office, we we face an increase in the trademark and trade name applications by 1% and 7% in 2021. So it really, it really surprised us, this, this increase. So in total, let's say like 65,000 more or less, this type were uh, applied in, in our office. Then the renewal applications increased too by 2 and 14% in trademark and trade name respectively. And then if we move to the European scenario, uh, the European trademark uh, applied by Spanish increased also 8.8%. So with all this data, we can say that there is an upward trend in, in protecting the IP rights. So, yeah. That sounds, I mean, I wouldn't say amazing, but that sounds very promising. So, <laughs> you know that, I mean, there is such an awareness and let's say then the, pandem the pandemic that is, thank goodness, already, let's say, even almost gone. You know, all these Spanish companies has been, you know, um, 
put an eye, you know, on you know being aware that they have to sell their products, and for that they need protection. So you know to include this in their let's say daily day strategy on the business. So it's it's good to know that it's always on the roadmap for Spanish companies, you know, to protect and to enforce their their trademark rights. So um, let's move to the other question, like. Uh, new technologies and the internet offers endless marketing and branding opportunities. So why post statistics? So that trademarks were the fastest growing intangible assets in terms of the number of registration in 2020, uh, surpassing the previous year's statistics by more than 2 million registration. Uh, in addition, the report trademark orientation and business performance in conjunction with the Spanish Trademark and Patent Office shows an increasing concern for brands and corporate strategy. So uh, what are the strengths and weakness in the protection of intellectual property, specifically in relation to trademark carried out by the Spanish companies? So um, I would say that uh, surely intellectual property rights are the engine for the economic growth. And uh, from the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office, our main, one of our main tasks is the dissemination of the intellectual property rights. And uh, specifically in the trademark uh, department, we highlight the importance of protecting uh, those rights as a, as a differentiation factor. Um, we, we're sure that the Spanish companies are aware of the importance of, of protection of the rights, and the study itself shows that 80% of the companies consider that the brand is a strategic asset in their company. So we're positive with the results, but uh, the, the same report shows as well that, the, uh, that some of the, of the companies uh, give more importance to the uh, promotion actions, considering the trademark, like uh, let's say for instance advertising, social media, and so on, over that legal protection. So we're seeing some of the companies that are using their intangible assets in the market without protecting them. And in that situation, sometimes they face real legal dispute. It can be because they are uh, infringing other uh, parties or right holders' uh, rights without knowing the existence of, of those rights. Or it can be because, because they're facing some infringement of their rights, but they didn't protect them in advance. So uh, in, the, in the office, uh, we always try to facilitate the protection and to bring those rights close to the company so they don't feel that there is something abstract um, and they can use those rights just to improve uh, the, the company itself. So for us, uh, we've been working in improving our website to offer more detailed information about protecting the trademarks, uh, not only in Spain, about uh, how is the, pro the procedure of registration, but also uh, in the internalization of the uh, trademarks. Let's say, for instance, the, the protection through the European Union, but also the Madrid system. So they come with all the information um, that uh, can help us to, to establish the best strategy for them. Um, for us, it's, in, it's important too to give this kind of digital uh, service or, or digital improvement because normally they tend to um, relationate more with the public entities by these digital means. So we're working this improvement too, and uh, this result that in, in 2021, 99.6% of the application were made by the uh, electronic means. So for us, it's, it's a really great result, and uh, that lead us to uh, be recognized as, as one of the most uh, innovative uh, office in, in the trademark field by the World uh, Trademark Review magazine. Um, we rank th in third position uh, with uh, South Korea and the U United Kingdom uh, Intellectual Property Office. So for us, it's, it's an honor to be to be there, because uh, this um, this magazine not only um, check the the registration uh, services that are offered to the to the right holders, but also the um, added uh, value services we can offer. So for us, it's, it's really important. To, to be at that, at that point. 
So congratulations. I have to say that I feel very proud, you know, of our Spanish Patent and Trademark Office being one of the leading in all this digitalization and, you know, offering service in a digital way to, to consumers and to, to clients, let's say. Um, one of the three pillars of INTAS 2022-2025 strategic planning announced last November call on promote and reinforce the value of brands. Uh, INTA will continue to advocate for the harmonization, simplification, accessibility, and integrity of IP registration and enforcement systems, uh, as well as for the defense, enforcement of trademarks, and complementary IP rights, and of course, valuation and commercialization of brands. This is also a key point in the strategic plan for 2021 and 2024 from, for this, at the Spanish Patent Trademark Office. Uh, such as promoting the strategic use of industrial property and fighting against counterfeiting and uh, infringement of, of intellectual property rights. Uh, also to move towards, as you have just uh, mentioned, to a more people-centered, sustainable, digital, innovative, transparent and efficient office. And it is also in the NDA of Andema, the initiative of the of the leading brands to highlight the importance of brand innovation and design for the companies and for the Spanish economy as well. So the question would be, uh, how can technology and legal tech solutions contribute to achieve this goal? So um, as I said, in industrial property rights are fundamental for the economic growth and the prosperity of, of a country, but also in a global uh, level. Uh, there is a direct link uh, between all this intellectual uh, property uh, intensive use in the private sector and uh, this prosperity and economic growth in the, in the society. Uh, there is a report uh, by INTA uh, and, and it's about the um, intellectual property office for the future, let's say like the ideal intellectual property office we're searching and it says that uh, the national offices uh, have to be at the, at the for, forefront of the technological uh, revolution and also to provide the best services uh, to, the, to the users. So that means that the national offices will have to, to adopt a proactive uh, attitude. We have to offer the solutions considering how important those tools are for, for the strategic uh, use of the intellectual uh, property. So um, that means uh, for us that we were uh, adopting this kind of more proactive, more activities, more user-centered uh, office and um, in uh, 2021 to 2024, we, we launch our strategic plan that contains uh, as a main uh, vision or mission uh, to achieve this, um, this technological uh, development, the revolution, have to, how to offer those tools to, to our users. And um, in, that, uh, in that strategic plan, participate not only the office, but also uh, with we take into account the user's uh, perspective. They were making contributions that, that we took into account in our final uh, version of the strategic plan. Um, some of them were more focused in, in other areas of the office, so we took it from the, from the plan and uh, we're going to deal with them in another scenario, but we were considering everything, not only the office perspective. So at that point, we launch our, our uh, strategic plan that is, it contains at the end uh, 51 projects. One of those projects is centered uh, in the technological development, the digital uh, tools we can offer. And we believe that the development of this uh, digital environment and the automation of the processes will lead uh, to, the, to, the, to improve that the strategic use uh, of the intellectual property rights for the users. So they, there's, we can say that there is a transversal impact of this technology, not only in the strategic use, but also in, in how to protect your rights and uh, how to deal with the infringement of, of those rights. That sounds amazing. So you are, let's say that you have, yeah, you have different irons. 
so that you are tackling. So it sounds like uh, you have a lot of lot of things has to be done in the in the incoming months within the office, and sounds like a whole challenge. Let's say so. It is good to <laughs> good to know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, going back to, to 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 our next question. So in in recent years, so technological solutions have become increasingly common in the in the legal sector and more and more institutions and company are offering their own solutions let's say like renew or, or die in, in in one sentence so do you think that the strong technological progress developed during the last few years in the legal tech sector among others uh, can be a threat or an opportunity for traditional ip systems and uh, in this sense, uh, what would be the threats and opportunities derived from this new technological progress? So um, I would say that uh, we're facing a, a technological uh, revolution. And uh, for us, we have to, to deal with this in, in a daily base, not only for the user's perspective, but also as, as an office uh, perspective. So all this automation, all the artificial intelligence that uh, when it's integrated in our daily tasks can make us to, to provide a better service and to uh, reduce not only the cost, but the time in order to provide a better answer for all our users. So we can say that uh, from the private point of view, um, all these technological uh, solutions can provide uh, to the users a better uh, protection or, or a better strategy or of, of, of the protections they want to achieve because they can do all this prior search with artificial intelligence, for instance, and they can know in advance all the prior rights that can uh, conflict with, the, with uh, the, the brand they have in mind to, to protect. Um, also, once you have your, your right protected, you can use artificial intelligence, for instance, to check the bulletin and to know all the um, other rights that can conflict uh, the, the your already existing rights. So all these technological solutions can, can lead to a better uh, protection, a better strategy, and uh, a more cost-effective uh, a strategy for, for the user too. From our point of view, when we integrate in our daily tasks this kind of technological uh, solution that are raising, um, it means that we can provide a better response, but a fast one, and a more certainty. Because for example, when you uh, apply for your trademark, we can, uh, there is a kind of report about the classification for the goods and services, the figurative elements, all this is made by a machine which uh, at, at the end provides us more time and more, let's say, energy to focus on all the things that require uh, our, our intellectual uh, things and that uh, to give to the technological part <laughs> the, the things that can be more automized. Um, so for us, at, at lately, at, in the last uh, instant, it, it give us uh, the chance to provide more quality uh, service, more transparency, and more uh, focus on the user uh, services. Yeah, because I think that, yeah, it, it makes absolutely sense in the sense that um, the, 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 the entrepreneurs, clients could concentrate, could focus more, you know, yeah. in their daily day business and of course, all these AI, artificial intelligence, and all these tools will help them, you know, to do this and be more efficient because exactly. they would, yeah, they would concentrate, you know, in the business and what they really need to do. And all these, um, all these tools will, will be, you know, handy, you know, to, to do more, to do the things that are more automatically, so exactly. they can, yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it sounds like a more efficient way of facing all these new challenges and all these new tools. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that all the entrepreneurs and all the Spanish companies, we appreciate, you know, this, mm -hmm. this new way of facing, of facing the situation with regards to uh, trademarks. So um, the, technolo the Technology and Innovation Report by UNTACT in 2021 identifies restrictive intellectual property regulations in developed countries 
as a difficulty for the application of cutting edge technologies and therefore a challenge to be faced. So do regulation hinder innovation or on the contrary is such uh, the current technological disruption we are experiencing that legislation is a step behind? So um, considering all the, the fast development uh, of the technology and also the, the the, the speed of the society, it's really difficult to align the, the regulations to the real situation that we face in the society. But we cannot say that uh, the legislation or the regulation is a step behind or, or is, is making innovation to be a bit slower just because the, um, the aim of the regulation is to provide a certainty uh, legal framework. So, in that context, we, not, we cannot consider that this is making innovation to, to go slower. So we can say that um, uh, normally when we face new technologies in the market, we don't really know how to, to, how to face them. <laughs> and uh, it seems that we need a legal certainty, a legal framework. We have to regulate this new technology. How are we going to deal with everything? And that uh, this is the first impact we have as a society. We need the legal framework, and we need it now. But um, if we um, go a step uh, behind and we see how this new technology integrates in the society, we have a bigger picture and then we can see or decide if the regulation we have can can give a legal answer to all the uh, potential conflict that may arise with this uh, technology or if there is a real need to regulate this uh, situation this happened for, for instance with the 3d printing that it seemed to be like a game changing we were all really excited i was going to change everything and like this and we were like uh, we need legal solutions for this and uh, at the end we realized that uh, with the legal means we have we can we can approach the situation with with certainty which is what we need in the in the society so it's not that uh, the regulation is, is always constraining the, the innovation, but it's there to, to give an answer to all the uh, certainties and um, questions may arise. And um, I would say a good example that uh, the regulation is not always a step behind of the uh, technology uh, can be the new types of brands because uh, since we uh, since our uh, new law in 2019 we launched these new types of, of brands that are um, are conceived just to, to work in the digital environment and we were expecting uh, many applications on these new types but Lately, we're not facing that many applications, so it can be a really good example that uh, regulation is a step uh, forward, the, uh, the society. Yeah, it's a, it's a good example. I, I think that society as well needs time, you know, to get used to all these new types of trademarks and all these new technologies because they have just popped into our lives. And we, even society needs to know, you know, how to, how to go ahead with them. And, how they can put it in a practice way with all these non-fungible tokens and everything is like you watch on news and you try to figure out where is the practice, let's say, how can you put all this technology into or incorporate this, all this technology into your, your daily life, let's say. So, so, yeah, but at the same time, even, for example, talking about these um, new types of trademarks, it's true that they are not, you know, launching into the market like, I don't know, like, like once and in a strong way, let's say. But it's true that the number is, you know, slowly and let's say steady increasing, yeah. you know, with, uh, yeah, with all these, I would say, sound marks or these color marks or why not smell <laughs> once in a, in a near future when technological uh, means would be on the table, let's say. Yeah. Actually, I remember uh, we, were, we were having a, a kind of round table too about the new types of brand when we launched them in 2019, when it, it late uh, 2018, just to, to promote those, those uh, new types. And uh, a lawyer told us, I don't really see 
a why to protect a sound mark or a multimedia or trademarks like this? Because this is purely figurative trademark. And we were like, okay, if you think in the, in the same way we've been thinking till now, surely you don't understand the sense of these new types, but we have to foresee in the digital environment and how the trademarks are going to, to, to act in that new environment. So if you think the same way, surely you, you will not understand that we have to, to think about the different uh, environment in which a trademark can, can, can be. Yeah, and with all, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I agree. And with all these new ways of communication, you know, through internet, through all the net, social networks with, with consumers, with clients, uh, yeah, all the entrepreneurs, all the companies, the Spanish companies, uh, needs to find, you know, new ways for sharing their message or communicating with all these, uh, yeah, with their potential clients. So, yeah, it's going to be also a new trend <laughs> that would have to be handled as well with all, yeah, within the office for sure, yeah. So let's go again to another question. So uh, McKinsey report published in February 2022, identified the current most important technologies, including process automation, connectivity, apply artificial intelligence, trust architecture, quantum computing, cloud computing, and others. So um, what technology solution and trends do you identify that can make the protection of innovation more efficient for the brand's point of view? Um, well, as I said, from the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office, we're working constantly in the uh, automation uh, processes and also uh, the artificial intelligence uh, tools that uh, we can provide not only in, in the means of our office, but also to the users. So we're working on that. And uh, at the European uh, Union uh, stage, they're working uh, on, on the development of these technologies. But we have to consider that, that there are some already existing tools that are already using, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence. For example, when you do the image search, there is artificial intelligence uh, behind. Uh, when you use uh, eSearch Plus for the trademarks, this, uh, they give you this similarity at uh, trademarks, and there is artificial intelligence behind the tool. And uh, also for the case law um, um, tool, uh, there is machine uh, translation uh, behind that automatically uh, gives you the European Union um, the uh, decisions and the EU, uh, EU IPO decisions, they are translated automatically in 31 different lang languages. So since uh, 2018 that they launched this uh, service, um, there are many, many uh, case law uh, decisions that are already translated by using this kind of uh, artificial intelligence that uh, they, they have. And um, they're working on new projects. Uh, for instance, uh, the ECP5 uh, uh, is, is related to emerging uh, technologies and, and the aim is to create a space uh, for the debate of the different technologies, not only at the, uh, with the EIPO and the national offices, but also with the European Patent Office, the WIPO and also TM5 or TM5, for instance. So the aim is, is to uh, debate all the trends, all the technological trends that can uh, affect the IP uh, rights and how to protect them, how to um, defend them as well, and uh, being develop de developing all those uh, tools. They're also working on some artificial uh, intelligence project, but in, only for, for the European Union Intellectual Property Office that may um, be given to the national offices, so we will uh, we will uh, use those technologies uh, too, and um, we have to consider that this is a really new scenario, and we are all working in how blockchain, the artificial intelligence, can. Um, help us to, to provide a better service. But for example, blockchain is being used for the proof of, of use in, in the registration uh, procedure in trademarks. 
it can be used for the certifications in the prior rights, uh, exhibitions, and, and so on. So all the utilities are, ha are being explored right now. And also at the uh, WIPO uh, atmosphere, they have launched this kind of uh, white paper for the blockchain and the impact of, of, of that technology in the IP ecosystem. So we are working, but it's really difficult to, to um, launch fast, uh, fast uh, solutions because it's something new. We have to explore, we have to see what's going on, and then to establish uh, the basis and keep exploring what, what will come with that. Let's say like step by step. So not running, but you know, with uh, let's say stable speed, and you know, reaching all the goals and achieving everything. Because yeah, I mean, it seems to it's be a lot. yeah, it's, it's a, lot, a lot, and everything seems to be in the same place at the same moment. So yeah, what yeah, we, we have to focus on each thing to be done each time, just to be sure that things are done, you know, in a proper way, but it's, I think the incoming year seems to be very challenging to the world in general with all these new technologies and especially for the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office, but I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that you are going to succeed. That's absolutely, I'm, I mean, I'm convinced about that. And, and, it, and it's going also, it's going to be very interesting as well, you know, to see how, you know, how everybody, you know, work together and get used to these new technologies into, into future. So um, um, a latest study on counterfeiting and illegal reproduction of guts carried out jointly with the OCDE and the UIPO indicate that these goods represent 3.3% of world trade and the statistics double for imports from European countries. So in a global world, when innovation competes without borders, what tools exist to detect and counteract the, le the legitimate use of our trademark assets? So um, it's, it's a fact that counterfeit uh, products, it, it's a real risk for, for the health and, and security of, of the consumers. But they bring also environment uh, issues. So taking all this into account, it is important to, to approach this uh, situation with a mindset that uh, not only for, for the consumers, but also for the protection and how to um, deal with all this uh, infringement and the, the piracy. So um, for us, um, it's important to, to establish uh, the strategic, uh, as I said, use of the intellectual property rights, but we have to cooperate with other um, entities in, the, in this uh, field. We believe that uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain in the future will deliver some tools to better protect the rights, but also uh, how, to, um, how to see all those counterfeit uh, products. Uh, the last report on the um, infringement uh, impact in, in the society by UIPO showed that uh, the loss in, in, in our sector or, or in all the sector at the end is about 83,000 million per year between 2013 and 2017. So those, um, those are really, really impact uh, figures to, to take into account. Um, in, in our uh, system, uh, the Spanish authorities that are competent for these um, counterfeit uh, products uh, in the criminal um, regulation are, is the national uh, police. And uh, we have to consider that the cooperation and collaboration uh, with them is essential for um, just to track these uh, counterfeit products that normally affect um, toys. Normally, uh, it, it's more focused on fake toys and uh, pharma pharmaceutical uh, products. So we have to, to emphasize the importance and the risk uh, from, from those counterfeit products. So when uh, the, all the, the, the national police uh, they are constantly investigating, and once uh, they, they see that there is a potential infringement, they take a sample, and then normally they, they contact us 
to see the database. So at this point, it's really important that you have your right register. And this is why we talk all the time about the yesterday use, about protecting and so on, because in all those situations, it, it, it is where you see the importance of protecting the rights. So um, the police comes to our database, and uh, normally we have this kind of communication to explain the scope of protection, because normally they don't really understand our point of view, so some clarification, it's, it's normally uh, required. Uh, we work together, we provide all the information uh, they may need. So hopefully uh, artificial intelligence and blockchains uh, will bring us some more tools. But for now, we, we're working in this way. We use database and uh, we collaborate uh, really, really closely. And uh, at the European Union uh, level, we have the IP informants uh, portal in which all the customs, the right holders, and uh, the law, um, law policy makers, uh, they, they can exchange information in order to, to see all these counterfeit uh, products and how to, to uh, take them. Uh, so I believe that there are some existing tools that uh, can be used until we have more developed uh, tools for, for these situations. Yeah, it comes to my mind, for example, when you mention about UIPO, the enforcement database that covers, you know, the, the, well, the, the members of European Union from a custom point of view once they have the trademark register. Uh, but I suppose that also the infringers would also, you know, use all this technology to become more sophisticated also in the way they do, you know, well, it, Things, it, it, can be, it, it can be tricky, this is the thing, you know, <laughs> even when we have the legal means, some people used to defend and some <laughs> others used to know the way in which you can infringe. This is like this, but uh, we believe that um, all the actions, all the tools uh, will make us succeed against all these counterfeit products that uh, they are a real risk in, the, in this society, so hopefully we will win. <laughs> Yeah, it's always, you know. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> okay, and uh, with every technological advance, um, as was the case with the internet, uh, legal systems have done their best to give legal security to holders of industrial property rights, especially trademarks in relation to the corporate branding. So um, facing or faced with such disruptive phenomena as the advent of metaverses, where virtual environments you were talking in your presentation about that. So, yeah, where virtual environments are mixed, let's say, with, uh, with real experience, uh, what challenge do you foresee from the point of view of trademark surveillance and protection? So, um, as I said, we're constantly reading about this <laughs> metaverse and the new uh, trends. So, um, I would say that uh, in, in the brands, from the brand's point of view, we are uh, used to see the, the, the trademarks in tangible assets. We can always touch the, the goods or, or, or the services. But um, the, the different uh, thing with the metaverse, <laughs> and, and this is the, the, the key point, is that uh, it's a computer-created environment in which the goods and services, they don't really exist, they, they're not tangible. So it's, it's a big challenge uh, how to protect your, your brand's there, how to deal with infringement, um, and all those things that are coming to, to your mind when, when thinking about a real world, but extrapolate it to something that you cannot touch. So at that point, we have to think if all the protection that uh, the right holder had obtained in the real world can be extrapolated to that virtual world. Because we have to consider that it's not the same the digital world than the virtual world. In the digital world, surely brands are protected because even if, if the means in which you're uh, providing uh, your services or offering your goods is digital, you will always get something tangible, a service or, or a good. But in this spiritual environment, there is nothing you can touch. So how come, how is the scope of protection? Can we say that we are protected with our brand in this virtual environment too? 
So all these things are, are, are coming. No? Um, we've been reading recently on this Hermes uh, back infringement in the metaverse, and um, Hermes gave a defensive um, action against this meta uh thing. But uh, the truth is that um, we cannot differentiate or make a real difference between the real world and the virtual one just because if you have your rights protected in the, in the uh, real world, the protection is the same in the virtual world. It doesn't mean you're not protected. There is something that it's important to consider and um, it, it's, a, it's a consequence uh, that um, we're facing with real and virtual, and is that all this, this reputation of the brands is diluted because normally, well, not normally, but sometimes, um, the reputation or, or well-known trademark um, respond to uh, quality, to um, all the, the public advertisement and the social media and uh, something that you can touch. So well-known trademarks, they are not having that uh, reputation in the virtual world. And consumers cannot feel that, um, that things that uh, a, a brand gives you in the real world. So it's something that we have to consider. And um, then there is something that we're facing too, that we have to say how it's to, to develop, but uh, we're having this kind of digital influencers <laughs> that is like, okay, they're kind of um, a real person, but in the virtual world, they, they behave like human beings, but they're not real. But th there are, let's say, two types of these digital uh, influencers. We have some of them that can be a reproduction of the real one, let's say, for, for instance, like uh, real influencers, uh, models, and, and so on, and some, be, this virtual uh, influencer that are created and, and have nothing uh, to, to be with the real world. So we can face some problems here because uh, this kind of virtual uh, influencers, if they correspond to a real person, all the image right can be, have to be foreseen as mm -hmm. well. And um, it's a trend that we don't know how it's going to end but we have to consider all the, the, the problems arising from, from that new thing. So let's see how, how, how it goes, but it's, it's a, an entire new universe, metaverse namely, <laughs> that uh, it's, it's, like, um, it's like to consider um, if, if we can behave like in parallel, like a real world, we have to see all the new rules in, in that new environment. Yeah, I see your point. I think that we need, at least from my perspective, we need to put everything into a more context. I mean, I think that we need more context and to see, you know, mm -hmm. how this will be work, you know, and let's say in a parallel, <laughs> completely <laughs> similar but different world. And, um, and when you were talking, I was, for example, thinking about classification issues, like, you know, class nine seems to be, you know, you know the, the class the to put, yeah, the more appropriate class to put, you know, all this world into, let's say, into details. But I was thinking if, because of all this movement, they will need to, you know, let's make some amendments to class nine, for example, I'm, I'm just, you know, you don't, I mean, you don't have to have a proper idea on this right now, but I was thinking that probably, you know, it would be need to amend or no, it could be fit, you know, just that way. So it's going to be an interesting thing, you know, also with classification issues, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was about to talk about this point in, the, in, the, uh, in some of the, of the questions. And we are seeing some of the new trademark applications for this virtual uh, environment. For instance, uh, McDonald's is, uh, is uh, one already registered in the UIPO. <laughs> uh, the trademark for, in class 43 for operating virtual restaurant. And not only this one, but also we, we see uh, Victoria's Secret in, in class 35 mm -hmm. that is, is talking about retail services in the virtual uh, world. So 
we can say that uh, the NIST classification or the international classification for goods and services is flexible enough to, to adapt to this new reality. So even if it's not already um, uh, there, we can adapt the, the regulation we already have to those new uh, trends. There's nothing new under the sun, let's say. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, another phenomenon that highlights the relevance and uh, value of intangible assets, as well as their relationship with the corporate branding, is the arrival of non-fungible tokens, so digital assets created for virtual environments under, you mentioned, blockchain technology, which are creating in record time a large market with multiple players and commercial value. So indeed, in this context, and I guess it's, let's say, more than one question for this, are the current regulatory architecture and national and supranational offices ready to enforce the rights of trademark owners? And uh, what would be or what is the role of companies should play in this reality? And just the last one, <laughs> are the current tools of surveillance and defense of trademark effective enough? Uh, it's, it's a broad question. Uh, <laughs> I know, I, I know. <laughs> I would say that... Uh, Take it by parts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One by one. But um, we can consider that we have uh, the, the legal framework to, to deal with all these new trends and the techn technological revolution. We only have to, as I said, with uh, 3D printing, for instance, we have to analyze again, uh, re read the, the legal framework we have, and uh, sometimes we have to consider also the, the interpretation uh, word uh, brought by, by the courts. So with all these uh, things, we, we, can, we can approach this new situation. We don't have to create new regulations because we believe that uh, what we have can, can give a legal uh, framework and legal certainty to the, to the situation. And uh, as, uh, as I said, the NIST classification is flexible enough to, uh, for, for these new uh, trademarks, not only, uh, as I said, uh, McDonald's, but also Nike, uh, Victoria's Secret, Disney. They are uh, registering um, all the, the new trademarks and uh, without any problem, without any issue. So it's just uh, to specify that the scope of the protection is going to be not only in the real uh, world we understood till now, but also for this uh, computer-created uh, atmosphere. So I, I believe we have uh, the, the, the framework for, for this situation. Uh, the other part of, of, of this is the infringement. And if the uh, regulation we already have is enough to, uh, to give a legal answer to the infringement can uh, happen in this virtual environment. And uh, we have to consider that the, the, the regulation we have now, it, it talks about uh, cease and desist uh, and uh, actions that uh, are taking place normally in the real world, but it doesn't mean you cannot take them to the virtual world because it's actually the same, but in a different atmosphere. So we believe we have the, the, the tools for, for all this new situation, and we'll see how it goes, because I'm sure the Hermes case is going to give some um, some insight about how to deal with this situation. and. Uh, it was a defensive strategy, but we have to consider that the registration is the policy we have to follow in order to prevent those infringement and how to give a better answer in, uh, to those situations. Yeah, the debate is open, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's hot, let's say, right now. So to wrap up this uh, rich discussion, uh, let's get creative. Uh, with the arrival of the so-called disruptive technologies such as 5G, AI or machine learning and the Internet of Things, uh, what will be the next uh, trends, legal and technological, on trademark branding? Even you have mentioned most of them during the whole uh, debate and the whole roundtable. Um, well, I will say we cannot foresee the, the, the future. Because if you ask people uh, five years ago if we would be where we are now, 
I think nobody ever imagined all this metaverse thing. And uh, we can go back actually to the Sims game we, we had when we were kids, but we always separate that virtual reality and a family we created and the house we created and it was in their computer. And, uh, but now the situation is really different because in this virtual environment, everything is happening. It's like uh, you have two lives, you have the real one, the virtual one, and everything can happen. So we cannot foresee what's coming next, but surely we're working in, in providing uh, the tools for, for, better, for a better approach of what will come. And um, let's say, for instance, smell trademarks, I would be really <laughs> happy to, to come on them. And uh, we don't know, but uh, from our perspective in the office, we have always uh, maintained a broad uh, perception or definition of the brands, because uh, we only required from the last amendment uh, we made in 2019, we only required to fit the representation by the technological means, and that technological means are open. So our um, focus is always to adapt to the reality we're, we're living. So let's see what will come, but we're ready for that, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's difficult to take a look into the crystal ball, you know, and yeah. let's uh, tell me what's coming next. But yeah, I think that uh, adaptation is one of the main things in human beings. So <laughs> adaptation in law and yeah, so that's a good politic, I guess. So this is all by the moment. I don't know if we have questions from the audience. Let me have a look. Okay, here we are. There is one. They said I would be interested in any insight into appropriate class specification description for, let me, uh, I have, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's coming, not to worry. So to appropriate class specification description for protection in the metaverse. Thank you. So it's, it's, so a, Jose. <laughs> it's a really good question. Uh, in the office, we had some, uh, some question about this. And we were seeing what the other offices are, are doing in our uh, in the European uh, Union level. At the UIP, as I said, uh, already registered the uh, McDonald's trademark for uh, the operating virtual restaurant. So they accepted that, and our main concern was about uh, the clarification and uh, precise of, of the, the scope of, of this classification. Um, point of view, but uh, we, we, we think at, at the very beginning that class nine was the main one, so you can say that you are going to provide everything in virtual environment, but we can see that if you go to the uh, good um, classification or the service classification and you specify that it's going to be provided in the virtual environment, for us is is precise and uh, clear enough. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on, on, on what are you going to offer, but just to specify that it's going to take place in the virtual world could be, could be enough. We're exploring things. <laughs> As I said, at the UIPO, we, we, we are all exploring this, but surely we're, we're, open, uh, uh, we're open to, to define this, this specification to adapt to, to the new trends. Yes. I think it's a very clear response. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have another one. So they said you have mentioned Cantar brand ranking among the global top 10 brand most, and uh, brand, sorry, most of them are technology, technology based. The question is applicable to any of them. For example, they said Microsoft. Does the technology give value to the brand or does the brand give value to the technology? Okay, <laughs> who was first? This wow. is like. Yeah, we come first. Um, the echo of the, uh, there is a Spanish set, which is which is first the egg of the hen or something like that. Well, I'm yeah. driving crazy, but... <laughs> but yeah, something like that. Well, I would say um, it's... I would say the brand 
is giving the value for, for to, to the technology. I, I it's would, not an easy question. I would, <laughs> yeah, we can say both of them, but, uh, but actually I would say it's, it's the brand giving the value to, to, the, to the technology. Because normally when we face strong uh, brands, they are constantly um, investing in the development of technological things. The, the, the good example is Lexus that is giving us this software for artificial uh, intelligence and the face recognition that normally uh, small brands are not investing in all those means because they don't have the economic uh, resources uh, for that. So I would say it's the brand that is kind of pushing in their strategy, we all want to innovate, we are going to stand out from our competitors. So the technological part is, is a way in, in your strategy to, to do it. So that's my, my point of view. No. Yeah, I think that technology, it's a, it's a mean. I mean, we, we need to use technology for getting our objective, not the other way around. So in that sense, no. yeah, I, I, I see I see your point and absolutely agree with your with your with your opinion. Uh, okay, we have another one. Which opportunities do you identify for trademarks in the metaverse? Good question too. Um, I would say um, we know the challenges; those are pretty clear. But the opportunities, we have to consider those too. Um, the thing is that, for, ex for instance, if you get something that is limited edition, you can get them in the metaverse, and you know that this is going to be there, it's not going to di disappear, it's not going to uh, lose value, and things like that. It's going to exist always, uh, and that's, that's a really good opportunity compared to the real world. Um, I think brands in metaverse are more adaptable. They can go faster, they can grow faster, they can um, go to a, a more open public, um, they can reach more consumers. So I would say that the opportunities is that uh, it's an open space compared to the real world in which uh, we live. And uh, that's for the brands is, is something that um, they can grow faster in, in that uh, environment, I would say. Yeah, no, yeah, because yeah, at the same time, for example, with the fashion industry, which is, seems to be yeah. very active, you know, in the metaverse with all these um, designers and, and all the functions, you know, like, uh, well, more, yeah, fashion, uh, everything, you know, in that sense. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. I don't know if we have another question. Okay. So I think there's no other question right now. So let's enclose. Let's do the enclosing, let's say. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Maria Jose for sharing her expertise with us today. Thank you very much. And of course, the Spanish Patent and Trademark Office for participating in this event and accept the challenge because that was <laughs> a big challenge. Um, next, I would like also to thank INTA for hosting and allowing us to, to I mean, allowing this event to, to take place. Um, and last but not least, uh, to each of you for sharing your morning with us, this raining morning, morning in Spain and taking the time with, to be with us today. I hope you, and we hope you have enjoyed this round table and look forward to seeing you in the future. So uh, it's Monday today, so have a great week ahead. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Maria Jose. Thank you.